regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me on the program today. So my colleague, John Petrolino, uh, has the first of a five-part series on the 50th anniversary of the Second Amendment Foundation that... Uh, Posted about 1.30 this afternoon, uh, talking extensively with Alan Gottlieb, as well as uh, Adam Kraut, uh, the executive director of the Second Amendment Foundation, uh, Juliana Verstall, uh, and uh, several other individuals associated with SAF. We're actually going to be talking with Alan on the show today, not about the past history of the Second Amendment Foundation, but the current events for the uh, Second Amendment group. We'll get to that conversation here in just one moment, but before we do... Let's talk about this for a second. Economists are warning us about massive tax hikes that could hit your IRA and 401k hard. With inflation rising and global uncertainty, it is no wonder that central banks and many Americans are turning to gold. If you haven't thought about gold yet, now's the time. Trust Priority Gold to help you diversify your savings with gold and silver. Text GOLDEN to 800-405-GOLD for a free gold info guide and see if you qualify for free shipping and storage. Experts agree physical gold is one of the best ways to fortify your savings. Act now to get your portfolio working for you while the market is golden. Text GOLDEN to 800-405-GOLD to learn more. That's GOLDEN to 800-405-GOLD. And now, let's uh, kick off our conversation with Alan Gottlieb. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll congratulate Alan on 50 years of Second Amendment advocacy, but um, I want to talk about what's going on right now with the Second Amendment Foundation, as well as get uh, Alan's thoughts on the state of the 2024 election. Take a look and a listen. Alan, thanks so much for joining me on the program. It's good to see you again, sir. Oh, it's always my pleasure, Kim. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Today is actually uh, unofficially Second Amendment Foundation Day at Buried Arms because John Petrolino has the first of a five-part series on the 50th anniversary of the Second Amendment Foundation that uh, is running today. So we got to learn a little bit about how the Second Amendment Foundation got started. Uh, and I would encourage folks to uh, to check out that. John has a great interview with Alan as well as a part of that story. But uh, but we're not going to be focused on the past. We're going to let John handle the uh, the formation of the Second Amendment Foundation. We have a lot of current events to talk about with SAF. A couple of uh, big court victories, including one in Pennsylvania, right, involving two carry laws. Yeah, we have a, we we got a, a preliminary injunction against two laws in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, knocking out two of their bans on carry, so to speak. Uh, you had to have a permit uh, to carry a firearm in your car. And the judge ruled and gave us the preliminary injunction against it being unconstitutional that, you know, you have to, you have to permit to carry your own car. So we knocked that law out. Of course, Pennsylvania will probably be appealing it. Uh, and then the second one we knocked out was in times of emergency, you don't need a permit to carry a firearm either to, for self-protection. Uh, so your Second Amendment rights don't stop at your front door. We knocked that one out as well. Uh, and so it's two big victories in Pennsylvania, in a, you know, in a week. That is fantastic. And Pennsylvania's laws regarding carrying an emergency, these are really, really strange. And it's something that, you know, I would encourage folks, this is something you might not think a lot about, but Pennsylvania had operated, it may, in fact, it may still be operating under a state of emergency, but it did operate under a state of emergency for like, what, four or five years continuously, right? There was a uh, opioid emergency, and then there were a couple of weather-related emergencies, and there was the gun violence emergency Similar to what we've seen with uh, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham do in, in New Mexico, right? You just uh, call something an emergency, and then all of a sudden, all of these new, not new laws, but all of a sudden, these these different laws um, start to impact people. And so in Pennsylvania, you had, there was a law specifically that dealt with under 21s being able to carry uh, during a state of emergency, right? But then what was this specific provision that uh, you're able to get an injunction against um, regarding the emergency rules and carry? That was another case uh, that, that we went on. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the court was sympathetic to our argument that when there's an emergency, that's when you need to be able to carry a firearm for self-protection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yet, uh, you know, time and again, we see the anti-gun politicians say, oh, no, no. When we uh, say that special circumstances exist, then your Second Amendment rights disappear. Yeah, especially when they cre create an emergency situation that has no ending to it. It means we just violated your segment rights, took them away because there's some kind of emergency out there. Uh, you know, and it never goes away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah you're, so those are a couple of East Coast wins, but you're also uh, working out in California. I mean, you're working all over the country. You've got more than 50 active lawsuits uh, that SAF is engaged in right now. But, you know, waiting periods, this is another issue that is 
it's been around for a while, but we're, we are starting to see some movement here, right? You've got this new waiting period law in Maine that uh, uh, is going to take effect, I believe, on August the 9th. Um, and then in California, of course, you've had that 10-day waiting period that's been on the books for years. And SAF is involved in a legal challenge to the California regime? Yeah. And in California, we just filed our motion in support of our summary judgment uh, in California. So the next case step will probably be the oral arguments to the case. Uh, but in California, not, it's not just a waiting period. It's, it's just amazing. You know, they passed it under the guise that you needed a cooling off period. So in case you were a little, you know, hot under the collar and, you know, you'd buy a gun and you'd come home and take out a family member, so to speak, you shouldn't be able to just walk in and buy a gun. We need a 10-day waiting period to, to cool you off, so to speak. You know, but it also applies to, let's say you already had 10 guns in your house and you wanted to buy gun number 11. Uh, you still have the waiting period anyway. And so there's no public interest or governmental interest at all in protecting anybody. If you're already a gun owner, you know, as an example, uh, to have a waiting period to get another firearm. Yeah, that is, you know, it's an excellent point. And it's something that, I, you know, I've, I've looked at the defense of these waiting periods, um, you know, the briefs that have been filed to date. And what's fascinating to me is that they're, they don't have a law that they can point to, right, that existed in 1791 uh, or 1868. So instead, the argument goes something like, well, but back then you might not have been able to buy a gun because there might not have been a gun available at a store. You might have had to order one and have it you know, shipped from overseas. You might have had to wait for a gunsmith to make a firearm so you could buy it. And so therefore, these modern day uh, waiting periods, these cooling off periods somehow fit with the national tradition of gun ownership. Which is ridiculous because back in 1791, I suppose it's possible that if you went to a store and you said, I, I would like to buy a, a musket or I'd like to buy a pistol, that's, well, you know, it's going to be two months. We've got to order one from London. It's entirely possible they would have said, OK, great, we've got one right here. Here you go. Uh, you hand me the money and you get your pistol. And that's the way it worked. So uh, well, there, there, there doesn't seem to be any sort of legal rationale under the Bruin test to, to, to defend these laws. No, there's no way to defend those laws. But also, like back then, you could have said, gone to your neighbor and borrowed a gun. In California, as an example, you can't go to your neighbor and borrow a gun and be illegal. <laughs> uh, you know, I would say if this was any other state than California, I'd say that uh, it's almost a, a, a near lock that you're going to get this uh, summary judgment. I, I can't say that because it is California. But I think that the the strength of the argument is definitely on the Second Amendment Foundation side. Um and, and is California sort of a test case? I mean, if you if you're successful there, can we go and then use that as a springboard to challenge uh, some of the other waiting period states like Colorado and, and, and Maine, which is, you know, getting ready to implement theirs? Sure. As we keep building on to our Second Amendment Foundation case law, we use those things to advance our suits in other jurisdictions. I think right now, Kim, we have about 65 uh, legal cases the Second Amendment Foundation has filed and is involved in nationwide. And I think about 19 of them are, are in California alone. So, you know, a little less than a third or 30 percent of our cases we file are in California. Uh, it's absolutely amazing the gun laws they have there that we're, we've, we've been very victorious so far, but they keep appealing it. So we're still up in the appeal situation. You know, we went on their uh, Sullivan ban, so to speak. We went on their uh, magazine capacity ban. We've won on uh, pu some public property suits that you can't ban guns on public property. But we've won on the 18 to 20 young adult issue. Uh, but they just keep appealing them. And eventually we're going to win. But as we've said before, a right delayed is a right denied. And they sure know how to uh, drag these cases out and cost us a small fortune on every single case that we file. But just imagine that the attorney general office in California is dealing with 19 cases that we filed in court. We've pretty much tied them up, I think. I, I think so. Um, but unfortunately, as you say, you know, this is this, it's not free. Uh, you know, it, it costs money to bring these lawsuits. It costs a lot of money to bring these lawsuits all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, which is, I think, you know, one of the reasons why we see this flooding the zone by the uh, gun control advocates to put as many of these laws in place all across the country so that, uh, again, it's an uphill battle for groups like the Second Amendment Foundation to go to court. Um, and in the meantime, you know, you've got folks like uh, Rob Bonta. And before Rob Bonta, you had uh, Kamala Harris, the Attorney General of California, uh, using taxpayer dollars to defend these unconstitutional restrictions. Yeah, and last year in 2023, because uh, we just had our audits completed, 
we spent approximately uh, $2.8 million on legal action across the country in one year. Golly. I mean, that, and, and I'm sure that if the, uh, if the funds were there, you probably could have doubled that, right? I mean, is that the, is that the sticking point? Um, you, you will bring as many of these cases as you can afford to bring. And if you had more donations coming in, you could bring more cases? Yes, within reason. Of course, we don't want to make bad case laws. So we're only bringing cases that we have a great probability of winning. So, you know, and you also have the, have the plaintiffs to do it. So it gets a little complicated. Uh, but yes, uh, if we had more funding, we'd bring more lawsuits. You know, speaking of the plaintiffs, I got to say there was another case I wrote about over the weekend. This is another SAF challenge um, to the federal prohibition on the uh, uh, gun possession for unlawful users of drugs. And the plaintiff in this case is not Hunter Biden. Um, he's actually a district attorney in Pennsylvania who is a medical marijuana holder, but who cannot. He's the top law enforcement officer for his county, but he cannot lawfully possess a firearm under federal law because he has that medical marijuana license. And so DOJ considers him to be an unlawful user of drugs. You know, a lot of times we we don't talk much about the named plaintiffs in these cases, but I was really struck by the the specific argument that this guy presents. Right. As you say, these things matter. I mean, you look at a guy like Zaki Rahimi. Nobody wanted him to be the poster child for the right to keep and bear arms. Here is a guy with a you know, pretty violent criminal history. On the other hand, here you've got a district attorney who says, why should I have to be forced to choose between my health and, and my ability to protect myself and my family? And I, I got to say, um, I don't know how you found this particular district attorney, but, uh, you know, when you're talking about quality of plaintiffs, I, you can't get much better than a uh, top law enforcement officer challenging a federal gun control statute. Yeah, we work very, very hard to find very sympathetic plaintiffs for our cases. Uh, and some of them are just great. Like one of my favorite ones, again, was in McDonald versus Chicago, which is the case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court, the Second Amendment Foundation filed that ended up incorporating the Second Amendment through the 14th Amendment, making it applicable to all the states so that all these suits now, by us and everybody else, can even be brought to start with. Uh, Otis McDonald was just a great sympathetic plaintiff, you know, an African-American living in the south side of Chicago uh, with drug deals going on, on a, you know, out on a street in front of his house. Uh, his house attacked because he tried to get the drug dealers off the street. In Chicago, Chicago, they wouldn't let him on a handgun, you know, and so he's just a great sympathetic plaintiff, a person who tried to keep his community safe. Uh, it was, you know, it was it was loved by everybody, uh, you know, and Chicago wouldn't let him have a gun in his house to protect himself, even after his house was, was attacked. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, you know, when you present the argument in that way, here's a guy who's an upstanding member of his community. People love him. He's a good guy. And the only reason why he can't protect himself is because the city of Chicago says well, you're not allowed to own the most common tool when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, uh, firearms for self-defense, um, and, you know, and I don't know if 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 Mr. McDonald's personal story was the persuading factor for the court. I, I, I think after Heller, I'd like to think it was a foregone conclusion. Um, but again, you didn't have somebody who was a convicted felon who was arguing, OK, listen, just because I raped somebody 10 years ago doesn't mean I should, you know, forever more lose my Second Amendment rights doesn't mean that the uh, city of Chicago can bar me from owning a handgun. When you've got an individual with, again, that 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 type of character, that type of connection with the community, uh, and again, a very compelling story that is representative of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the country, mm -hmm. right? Um, then all of a sudden, that person isn't just a, a sympathetic plaintiff, but he is and she, or she is representative of uh, gun owners as a whole. Yeah, so we work, we strive very hard to find very sympathetic plaintiffs and also vet the plaintiffs that we have uh, so there aren't things in their background. You know, uh, for every plaintiff we get for a case, there's probably two we've, that we've had to unfortunately reject because they aren't sympathetic or they posted something on their in TikTok account or, you know, on, on social media that uh, is not exactly flattering. And so we have to say sorry, but we can't use you as a plaintiff. Yeah. Well, uh, again, uh, you know, in the case of uh, Otis McDonald, it was a, a knockout. And I think uh, with the uh, DA there, uh, Mr. Green, I think his name is, uh, again, I think a uh, another sterling plaintiff. Um, all right. So we've been talking a little bit about California and I mentioned Kamala Harris. I, I, I've got to ask, Alan, uh, is we have not spoken, you and I, since Joe Biden exited stage left and uh, Kamala Harris began her audition to become the uh, Democrats gun banner in chief. 
What are your thoughts on the uh, anointment of Kamala Harris? And and does this change SAF's uh, plans for this election cycle in any way? Well, we don't get directly engaged in elections per se, but we do have out right now uh, a TV, 60 second TV spot running on national television that talks about the dangers of Kamala Harris based on her record and where she wants to go in attacking our Second Amendment rights. Uh, and so that, that that actually starts airing today. Uh, and so I'm kind of excited about that. But, you know, when Kamala Harris was uh, the attorney general in California, she actually wanted to do a, a confiscation program, a forced gun buyback for peanuts for your firearms and, and, and make every firearm in California, uh, you know, sold to the state, so to speak, so that nobody could own a firearm. That's how extreme she is. And, of course, she's been the so-called gun czar in the office of uh, gun, so-called gun violence in the White House, working day and night with all the anti-gun groups and, and, and anti-gun activists nationwide. So she's really, they, they'd have, if she becomes president, they're, they're, they're lobbyists, so to speak, be running our country. Yeah, I mean, Joe Biden clearly opened that door, right? Uh, nominating David Chipman as the ATF director, establishing the White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. But as you say, he put Kamala Harris in charge of that office, uh, a person who, you know, back in the uh, Heller days when she was the district attorney in San Francisco, uh, helped to author an amicus brief arguing that the Supreme Court should uphold D.C.'s handgun ban, should uphold its storage laws because the Second Amendment doesn't protect an individual right to keep and bear arms. I mean, that that was Kamala Harris's view uh, back in 2008. Uh, I don't know if she has ever directly refuted that contention, but certainly her actions since then indicate she doesn't really believe that we've got the right to keep her arms. As you say, she called for that, uh, um, uh, what was it, the voluntary uh, but mandatory buyback, right? Uh, and not only when she was the AG, but when she was running for president. That was her big plan on how to deal with so-called assault weapons. Uh, we're going to have a mandatory buyback. And if Congress doesn't do it in 100 days, she said she would use executive actions to try to implement a ban. Yeah, this, this is a, a politician that isn't just saying we don't have Second Amendment rights. This is a politician that wants to take our guns away, period. You know, and if she is elected, she would be in a position to uh, start appointing Supreme Court judges and lower court judges, too. We just talked about the Ninth Circuit. Four more years of an anti-gun president uh, and one who makes their anti-gun ideology one of the center components of their administration, what kind of damage could that do to the uh, to the judiciary and to our Second Amendment rights uh, and our and and you know ability of groups like SAF to challenge these unconstitutional restrictions in the courts? Well, I'll tell you what it would do to us, Cam. It would slam the courthouse door in our face so that we couldn't take our cases to court and have a redress for unconstitutional gun laws that are, that were passed by Congress and signed by Kamala Harris into law. Uh, it, it would sort of, you know, that they're supposedly they're protecting democracy. This would totally basically shut out gun owners from being able to participate in democracy. Again, you know, the uh, the stakes are high this uh, election cycle. We say that every four years. But um, I mean, we've seen the damage that the Biden administration, the Biden Harris administration has done over the past four years with their executive orders, uh, with the uh, establishment of the White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Uh, and again, we, you know, they're not they're not shy about their plans for the future. They're telling us exactly what they want to do, uh, and none of it uh, is good for our right to keep and bear arms. Alan Gottlieb, again, I thank you so much for coming on the program today. I thank you for 50 years of Second Amendment activism and advocacy. Uh, congratulations! I know we're still about a month away from the official anniversary, but I'm going to give it to you an early uh, anniversary wish anyway. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Well, thank you, Cam, and happy birthday for your 50th anniversary. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that you were born when the foundation was, foundation was founded. Uh, a, real com a real commonality and common purpose. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Yes, I'm going to enjoy the last week of my 40s here, uh, but I appreciate that. And, uh, Alan, I will talk to you on the other side of that birthday here very soon. Thank you, sir. Great. Have a great day. Thank you. My thanks once again to Alan, not only for joining me on the show today, but for all of the work that the Second Amendment Foundation has done over the years to advance and secure our Second Amendment freedoms. All right, before we get to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day and our recidivist report, let's talk about this for just a second. At the very heart of our democracy lies the principle that we hold sacred, free speech. It's the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish, but in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future – 
are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives, leaving many of us feeling voiceless in conversations that are crucial to our financial independence and security. That's where Wealth Protection Research steps in, armed with a mission that's never been more critical. Wealth Protection Research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech, committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Now, they tirelessly seek out financial experts, particularly voices that challenge prevailing narratives, and especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 election wealth protection report that highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch, and you can get it completely free when you text the word IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment doesn't think you can handle, and to take control of our financial destinies. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. All right, on now to today's uh, Armed Citizen story, our good day to the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a disturbing case out of Illinois. Man charged with possessing gun and fatal shooting of Round Lake Beach child on probation for robbery. And it wasn't like this probation was about to expire. No, according to the uh, uh, Lake County prosecutors, the 19-year-old who was uh, arrested and charged with um, the shooting death of Valeria Rodriguez, a 15-year-old teen from uh, Round Lake Beach, um, this guy just placed on probation last year, 19-year-old Sherbonia Poole Jr., According to police, investigators conducted a search warrant last Friday on a home in Round Lake Beach. They located a semi-automatic pistol and other evidence that they connected to uh, Sherbonia Poole Jr. He lives at the home where the search warrant was conducted. According to police, he possessed the firearm that was used in the homicide. So the Lake County State's Attorney's Office uh, right now has approved the charge of unlawful possession of a weapon by a felon. They do expect that additional charges are pending uh, with additional forensic information. Now, according to police, the shooting happened last Wednesday about 9 o'clock in the evening. Uh, Round Lake Beach officers arrived at the scene. They found a 15-year-old girl who had suffered a gunshot wound inside a home. Preliminary investigation shows that a person fired a gun outside of the home, uh, but nearby, a, uh, what they describe as a stray bullet from the fire, entering the Rodriguez home, striking the 15-year-old. She was taken to a local hospital where she was pronounced dead. According to the uh, state's attorney, Investigators recovered one 9mm shell casing near the park across the street from Rodriguez's home. They identified Poole as a suspect in the case, then executed the warrant at his residence where they recovered a 9mm handgun. Poole also observed walking in the area where the spent shell casing was later recovered. Now, according to the, um, this is from the Lake and McHenry County scanner, Poole is a convicted felon from an armed robbery case out of Lake County last year. He was charged in July of 2023 with armed robbery with a firearm, theft by threatening, as well as multiple counts of aggravated unlawful use of a weapon for another incident in Round Lake Beach. He ended up taking a plea deal to one count, one single count of aggravated robbery. That's a class one felony. And in exchange, all of the other charges were dropped. Now, if this case had gone to trial, Poole was convicted and had been sentenced to the maximum terms, he could have been looking at 45 years in prison. Instead, He was sentenced this February to, quote, periodic imprisonment. Don't even know what that means. Maybe go to jail on the weekends. 300 hours of public service and 48 months of probation. Yeah. So authorities in Illinois had the opportunity to put this 19-year-old behind bars for a prolonged period of time as the consequences for his violent actions. Instead, they gave him a plea deal dropped almost every charge, and gave him what amounts to a probationary sentence. Uh, with Again, periodic imprisonment. Report to jail on the weekends, it sounds like. We don't know the specifics here. Certainly wasn't 45 years behind bars. It wasn't even four years behind bars. This 19-year-old was basically allowed to skate, and here we are just months later, and uh, police have said that he is at least a, a suspect in the death of this 15-year-old. All right, on to today's Armed Citizen story from San Diego, California, where a a driver fended off a a carjacking attempt over the weekend. Thankfully, he was able to uh, protect himself. According to uh, On Scene TV and the uh, Times of San Diego, this happened on uh, Saturday. A uh, male victim driving a Mercedes 
was uh, trying to turn into an apartment complex, but a truck pulled up. Two guys, at least one of them believed to have a gun, then got out of the truck, confronted the man, uh, basically told him to get out of the Mercedes, tried to rob him. But the uh, victim, according to the Times of San Diego, has a concealed carry permit, had his firearm on him, drew his pistol, and fired a shot, which then caused both of these suspects to flee on foot. They didn't even get back in the truck. They just ran down the street. Uh, National City Police responded to 911 calls, which included a report that a uh, male had jumped over a fence and into a backyard. At that point, canine units from National City and the San Diego Police Department, along with the San Diego County Sheriff's Department, uh, conducted a search. The uh, backyard apparently full of items cluttered with, uh, you know, trash and whatnot, uh, but they didn't find anybody. Uh, when officers then it went in the backyard on foot, someone noticed a vehicle with tarps covering it, and they spotted a man who had been lying quietly under the car a few yards from officers. Uh, once he was located, the suspect surrendered. No words on any charges in this case, but uh, again, it appears the uh, driver, the carjacking victim, uh, was acting in self-defense and is not going to be facing any charges. Finally today, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, a, a stranger in Chesterfield, Virginia, who came to the aid of a man who was choking during a uh, lunch last week. A uh, scary situation. The uh, family had apparently gone out to eat at Bonefish Grill. Their grandmother had just passed away. Um, and this was sort of the, you know, family get together um, where everybody, you know, gets together, shares memories, has, you know, one last family gathering before everybody goes their separate ways. Unfortunately, um, one of the individuals started choking uh, a guy named John. His sister Amanda talked with uh, uh, WWBT in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and said that, you know, we're out to lunch, kind of celebrate her life, talk about memories of her, and all of a sudden I heard my brother's wife say John's choking. So she got out of her seat, saw that her brother was choking on a piece of food. She said minutes felt like hours. She said, I tried to get underneath him, but I couldn't lift him. He was just stiff as a board because he was having a seizure while he was choking. And at that moment, she said, Amanda said, a uh, man sitting inside the restaurant ran over and came to the rescue. She said he just lifted him up out of nowhere, gave him the Heimlich maneuver. She said there's no way that he could have had the strength to do that for as long as he did without God. That uh, individual, a guy named Tony Dean, cowboy Tony Dean, as he is known, uh, he says that he was having lunch with a business partner when he heard the screams and jumped into action. He said something in me just said, do the Heimlich maneuver. So I was able to get him off the floor dislodged the piece of food in his throat, and John is okay. A couple of days later, John and Dean had the chance to reunite. Dean said, you know, it just validated that I was doing the right thing at the right time. He said, I give all the honor to God for having a level of discernment to know that someone was in distress and I was able to help them. Amanda says that uh, Tony Dean is the family's hero. She says, I'm eternally grateful for Tony saving my brother's life. It is a miracle. So in the right place, at the right time, wasn't able to do the right thing. Tony Dean, there in Chesterfield, Virginia, we thank you for your very, very good deed. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as always. I'm looking forward to seeing you back here again tomorrow. Not exactly sure who our guest will be at this point. I've got a, a couple of feelers out, but uh, we'll be talking about the latest Second Amendment news and information. Still waiting to see who Kamala Harris is going to pick as her vice presidential nominee. A lot of buzz around Gifford's co-founder, Mark Kelly, U.S. Senator from Arizona. I still think he's probably the front runner at this point, but uh, we could see uh, news of a vice presidential pick by the uh, Harris campaign at some point this week. We're paying very close attention to that, as well as uh, Joe Biden's plans to reform the Supreme Court, which uh, aren't, I don't think, going to go anywhere in uh, Congress Right now, uh, Joe Biden is the epitome of a lame duck president, and I don't think even if Democrats got behind this call in an attempt to uh, try to, you know, make uh, the Supreme Court a campaign issue, I don't think his reforms are going anywhere over the next few months. But uh, we might be talking about that tomorrow as well. In the meantime, be sure to check out BarryAndArms.com throughout the rest of the day. We're keeping you up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation including Armed Citizen Stories, like the one we brought to you from San Diego. We'll see you back here tomorrow. But thanks again for taking part in the show today. Hope you had a great weekend, and we'll see you back here on 2-8 Tuesday. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.